This is my synopsis of relevant background to IADP Expedition 352. I'm speaking obviously from this perspective as somebody who went on the expedition and also has been working on expedition samples. I am however not drawing exclusively from my personal experiences here, though I will tell you of them. I am drawing from the literature as well. And so there are three papers in particular, which I think are very relevant to this presentation. One is the Reagan et al. International Geology Review 2017 paper, which is actually a nice pithy synopsis of the expedition reports highlights. And that was published, you know, that got published in 2017, shortly after the, uh, shortly after the expedition. Um, so that was a good one. And a lot of the, some of the summary slides I'm using, some of the summary diagrams I'm using come directly from that paper. The other two papers, two to three papers that are important here are the John Chervais lead author papers. One of these is published already. It's on four arc basalts. And the other one is in press right now. And we have the in press version. It's on bonanites. Uh, this is basically a sort of descriptive petrology of the two igneous rock types that we encountered in this expedition. There's a recent, like this year, paper by Scott Wadham and a lot of co-authors. All of these papers, if you'll notice, have a lot of co-authors because they're team efforts. The Wadham and all paper is an overview of the mineralogy and mineral chemistry of these rocks, obviously quite relevant to what we're doing. And the the last paper, which is in press right now with American Mineralogist, is a paper that arose from the first year of this class doing these, this work, a paper by Jesse Schulp and a number of other student authors that is now, come, now getting ready to come out in American Mineralogist, uh, looking at some anomalous chemical mineral chemistry features that they discovered in the Expedition 352 samples that actually have some bearing on how the bonanites come to be. So... So those are the papers in the collection and canvas that you should take a look at for sure, though I would recommend that you take a look at all of the ones that are really talking sort of descriptively about the petrology. And the summary and the expedition report, or it, which is quite long, gives you detail on specific places and specific pieces of core or holes that you're working on. So if you're working on 1442 samples, you might want to look at the, the chapter on U, site U1442 uh, and see what it has to say, likewise with 1439. All IODP expeditions have a set of scientific objectives. The scientific objectives are worked out in an expedition proposal, um, refined through a review process, and essentially become the core drivers for what happens on the ship, and then that happens in the post, the post cruise science that follows it. And for IODP Expedition 352, these were the four sort of key things that we were trying to accomplish. Um, one was, and uh, you, know, you can look at the lingo here, obtain a high fidelity record of magmatic evolution during subduction initiation and early arc development, test the hypothesis that four arc basalt lies beneath bonanite and understand chemical gradients within these units, use drilling results to understand how melt mantle melting processes evolve during and after subduction initiation and test the hypothesis that the four arc lithosphere created during subduction initiation is the birthplace of supra subduction zone ophiolites. Um, that's what comes straight out of the, the scientific prospectus and it's a little bit technical. So let me sort of gel it down for you. There are really two big things, two big questions that we're trying to answer in this expedition. One is, how does subduction turn on, essentially? How do we start subducting something, and what happens when we do that? There have been, and, and Isobonin, the Isobonin volcanic arc has been kind of at the hype locality for studying this question for the last probably, oh, 30 years. Because it's oceanic, because it's not a heavily sedimented subduction system, so we can get to igneous rocks pretty readily, and because there are emergent islands which have interesting rocks on them, i.e. the Bonin Islands, and a lot of Japanese drilling and dredging and sampling with Shinkai, which is their version of Alvin, have happened in this region. And so we actually have a pretty good map of the surface of the Pacific Ocean 
and the back, you know, the, the, the right behind the Biden behind the Bonin Island sections of the Pacific Ocean here on the overriding plate in terms of rock type. And it's suggestive of a model for forming new crust associated with the start of a subduction zone. Um, the idea being that you produce basalt, for, that you that you founder the crust, and you can sort of see it here on the left, that you founder the slab, that you basically the old ocean crust fails, it begins to sink away, you, you create a gap, hot mantle rises, and you get this decompression melting event that creates initially basalts. But then as subduction proceeds, magmatism changes and starts to be more influenced by the dehydration of the downgoing plate producing in this case, this unique rock type that we've been looking at called the bonanite. So we wanted to test this and we wanted to have a better idea of, of how it all worked. The second question that was really relevant related to connecting what is happening today in the Izubonian system to what may have happened in other subduction systems around the world um, in the past. And it relates to the weird sort of lithologic similarities between what we see on the ocean floor in the Izubonian subduction system right here out by the trench and what we encounter in these unique rock assemblages that we run into in mountain belts called ophiolites. Ophiolites, you probably heard that term from intro. We haven't fussed with it too much in class, but it's an important thing to understand. It's a sequence of rocks. It's a vertically stacked sequence of rocks, and you can see what it looks like over here. This is actually the, the schematic section through one of the classic ophiolite bodies, the Trudos ophiolite of Cyprus. What you have then is mantle-derived rocks at the bottom. You have cumulate rocks, which are largely gabroic, immediately overlying that. Then there's a complex of basaltic or diabasic dikes, which are believed to be feeder dikes, that then feed up into lavas. The lavas are, in cases, pillowed, in some cases, sheet flows, the suggestion being that they are erupted underwater. And so when folks looked at the Trudos ophiolite and now other ophiolites around the world, there's a huge one in Oman, there's a huge one in, in, um, in Newfoundland, um, and, a, you know, a couple actually in Newfoundland, and there's there's another one in um, another one a little further east in Canada. They're they're all over the place. These are very geologically common features. They mark the boundaries between geologic terrains in a lot of cases, and the belief has historically been that these represent ocean crust, that they're trapped bits of ocean crust. However, the particulars of the stratigraphy of these things. The particulars of the igneous geology of the materials in them, of the lavas and rocks in them, match up better to what we see in the Izubonin than they do to normal ocean crust that we've drilled with ODP and DSDP and IODP expeditions over many years. And so the question that was posed is, are ophiolites actually not ocean crust? Maybe what they are is for our crust that happens only during the initiation of subduction zones, which would change our picture of what ophiolites are all about in a pretty fundamental way. And so one of the questions we were trying to understand is, is that connection? Is our ophiolites, all these things we see in the rock record, actually subduction initiation records as opposed to just ocean crust records? And so what this did is it brought together a science team of people with reasonably divergent interests. And so you had folks like me who are really subduction zone scientists who are looking at the igneous rocks and the metamorphic rocks of subduction zones to try to understand what's happening in those places. I am, oh, you can find me on the dot, you can find me in the picture, I'm there. Yeah. <laughs> then, then you have another third of the crew, which are ophiol what I would describe as ophiolite scientists. These are folks who are field geologists who spend their lives in the mountains and are really studying a lot of these, you know, these ophiolites in around the world. And, and so they're interested to, to see what this analog on the bottom of the Pacific might look like. Um, and they're arguing with the subduction people about what might be going on. And so then you had a third of the others who were doing a variety of different things. So we had some high, we had some, uh, what do we have? We had some, uh, sedimentologists, because there are, you know, there's interest in the sedimentary geology on the ocean floor near a subduction system. Uh, we had seismologists who were wondering about the deformation of the rocks. We had 
paleomagnetics people, mostly, I mean, some of this is because the ship actually has a big paleomagnetic system and someone needs to run it. We have folks doing education and we had one paleontologist and paleontologists are actually really, really important in this, in this endeavor because they are the people who tell you where you can drill and they do it by telling you the ages of the sediment overlying the igneous rocks that you want to find. And so you use them to sort of put brackets on the ages to allow you to find the right spots. And we had only one paleontologist and here he is right over here. He was a master's student from Florida State University who discovered much to his chagrin that he was it for paleontology on the cruise the day he got there because the other people who were, the other person who was supposed to come uh, couldn't make the ship. And as he did, as it turned out, he did a brilliant job. And if COVID ever gets past us, you might see him walking around the halls in USF because he's actually starting to do a PhD with us here in the near future. Not in, not in anything with me. I mean, he's a paleontologist. Here's the ship. Enjoy these resolution. It's 143 meters long. It's 21 and a half meters wide. It's a pretty good size ship. It has a derrick in the middle of it that's 661.5 meters above the water line. So you got this big, tall oil derrick kind of thing sitting in the middle. Basically, it's a ship with a big hole in the middle because that derrick runs right down to the bottom of the ocean. There are sort of two big sort of inhabited spaces on the ship. One is known as a science stack, which is like a seven-story science laboratory building that encompasses ship operations and all the underway laboratories handles all the core that comes up, does the testing analysis. And that's where I was working and all the science team were working. Then there's the sleeping quarters, which are toward the front of the ship, away from the science stack. I blissfully got something down low, sort of you know near the bottom, so I didn't have a lot of rock and roll to things. The full complement on the ship when you're out is 115. There's about 35 sci there's about 35 people on the science team and another 25 technicians. Then there's the crew who the crew, the drillers and the caterers who actually and the caterers are actually the people who run the galley. They clean up after everything. They actually do your rooms. It's like being in a hotel a little bit because they come in and make your bed and they do all of that kind of stuff. They do the laundry and they sort of keep everything running. And they need to do that because when you're there on the science team on a IODP cruise, you are on call to do work 12 hours a day, every day for 60 days. It's a two month cruise and you're 12 hours on, 12 hours off the entire time. So, and so there are people looking after you and making sure that you can do that. The drilling itself, like I said, it goes straight through the bottom of the ship you can they can go down to 8000 meters below sea surface and then another you know and that you know the maximum that's basically the limit of the amount of drill string they carry on the ship so basically they can get down if they wanted to drill a thousand meter hole they could take they could go down as much as 7000 meters in water before they got there in our cases it was never that deep we were the deepest site we have is about 4400 meters below um sea level uh, below, you know, to hit the seafloor, and then that drilling goes a couple hundred meters beyond that. How does the ship do this? It has an amazing dynamic positioning system. There are thrusters around the entire sides of the ship, as well as the the main the the, the main screws that actually allow it to move. This positioning system allows the ship to maintain its position to within three percent of the step, the length of the drill string down to the seafloor, so 3% of water depth, which is to say if you've got six kilometers of drill string down here, 6,000 meters of drill string, you're within, what, um, 180 feet of, of perfect. And they can drop a drill string into a little reentry cone with remarkable aplomb, no matter how deep it is, and no matter how obscure it is. And that was always one of the wonderful things to watch on it, because when you're drilling, you actually have to run the string. You actually pull the drill string up and replace the bit and put it back down every 48 to 60 hours. And so this was a constant sort of show on the ship. Where were we? We talk about the Izubonin subduction system. Here it is. It runs. It's this Izubonin trench that runs south off of Japan, sort of from Tokyo Harbor on outward. We were out here south of the Bonin Islands. And if you look at the specific holes that we drilled, they're over here, uh, the four red dots. 
The original idea was to drill two holes, one in the deeper section and one in the shallower section. However, our our director for drilling, our science, you know, our, our sort of drilling director on the ship had some clever ideas about how to get more time, more time on drill that worked out brilliantly. And so we actually got two additional holes out of it, which is fortunate because things didn't go as planned and they almost never do on any of the holes that we intended. So we actually got four holes drilled, two in bonanites and two in four basalts. And so the idea being something like this, here's the sort of slope of the overriding plate um, coming down to the trench. And rather than try to drill a single hole through all of these sequences, what we did is we punched a couple holes here and there to get sampling of it and to try to see the key boundaries as we did it. So the total cored interval that we, the total area that we cored about 1,685 meters for the entire cruise, which is not a whole lot, except for it's hard rock, it's really hard to do. Uh, the total core recovered is only about a third of that, 560 meters, and that just relates to the fact that it's hard rock. It's very difficult, the kind of drilling that we're doing. What they have is a tricone bit with tungsten carbide teeth, and it mostly just crushes the rock and beats it up, uh, and that's tough. It's very, very difficult to get through that. The percentage of recovery you can see over here, it's uh, pretty good in the bonanites, really crappy in the basalts, and obviously in the sediments, they're actually doing just straight up piston chlorine, so they get really high results. My role on the ship, everybody has a specific role. Some people were petrologists who were describing the core as it came up. Some people were physical property specialists who were doing, you know, looking at gamma ray counts and seismic wave velocities and all sorts of other stuff through the materials that we brought up. I was in the inorganic geochemistry lab. I was on the midnight to 12 shift, which kept me more or less on the time as home, which was nice. My job was to analyze that which was removed, that which was brought up in the core and, dis and determined to be studied. And so we would analyze all the sediments for volatile hydrocarbons, and that's more of a safety requirement. We try to make sure there wasn't any. Um, we would squeeze out and analyze pore waters from things that had pore waters, which is largely the sediments. And then most of our work though on this cruise was actually analyzing the recovered bulk sediments and primarily the recovered igneous rocks. And so we were digesting and analyzing rock samples for most of the crews. Like I said, we had a lot of equipment. This is the, their, this was at their time, the inductively coupled plasma emission spectrometer, such as we have in our, our first floor science center. Their instrument was a different one, a Lehman Labs Prodigy. Um, they has since been replaced. They're kind of hard on instruments. They last about six or seven years out at sea. Uh, and then they have to update and replace. These are gas chromatographs. This is where we were measuring the um, methane and ethane. Unfortunately, we never really ran into very much of that. Uh, we also had spectrophotometers and ion chromatographs and other kinds of things to measure other kinds of cations and anions. And we ran a range of things on these samples, some of which are standard. When you're in the geochemistry lab, there's certain standard measurements that you make. You always measure chlorinity in the waters. You always measure sodium content and calcium content. Uh, you always measure sulfide and sulfate. Those are things that you just do. Um, and they're just part of the records that are generated uh, from the drilling expedition, irrespective of whether anyone's going to use them or not. But like I said, a lot of the focus for us was really analyzing the igneous rocks. It's a fully equipped lab. It's it's actually remarkably well equipped and they are, they're staffed with technicians who know what to do with all the instruments. So as a staff scientist on the crews, I am mostly telling them what to measure, not actually getting my hands too terribly dirty doing the measurements, uh, but I was pretty involved in the calibration of the instruments and that kind of stuff. And so just give you an idea of days on the JR, this is a typical, um, well, not, yeah, what a prettier sun sunrise mornings when you're on the midnight to 12, so if you see a lot of sunrises, what the bunks look like, they're small, they're not in there much. You have the room for your, you have the room to yourself for 12 hours a day. Your roomie is always on another shift. There's the drill string and the drillers are always busy. Um, this is our technicians bringing in the core. And then once the technicians bring in the core, the staff, the science science team starts to look at the core and describe it and identify things that need to be sampled from it. This is our paleontologist looking at some of the stuff out of the sediments to try to figure out how old they are. Uh, our co-chief scientist 
looking desperately for a salt and bonanite as it comes up. Um, the drillers trying to figure out how to get this crap out of the damn core. We didn't have too many accidents in that regard. It seemed to work pretty well. Them actually finding the hole again, that's a reentry cone down there, and they are able to drop the bit right into it. It's just astonishing. You have off time. You have break hours. This is the sunrise break. Uh, everybody up on what is known as the steel beach, checking it out. Yeah, a little funniness. And then, you know, describing the core. Um, occasionally visitors. And then the caterers get out of control occasionally. This was sort of a good, this was sushi night. And then, of course, you have, then, then of course, one of the things you're doing is you're actually choosing samples that you want to work on post cruise. And so they have what are known as sample parties, and you identify the bits and pieces that you want. And this is what the Pacific looked like. It was a summertime cruise, and it was remarkably calm much of the time. Some results that you should know about. I'm going to very brief on the sediments. Mostly, we were not seeking sediment. Uh, our first hole had sediment. The others were typically less than 100 meters. The main thing to know about the sediments is that there was a change in their composition as we went from the shallower sites, the ones where you were about 3,000 meters below, uh, you know, below 3,000 meters to seafloor. There you had a lot of carbonate in the sediments. There were a lot of nanofossils. They were readily datable. Um, they were a pain in the ass for me because it was really hard to cook off the CO2 made for bad totals and bad LOIs. And well, we, we, we were aggravated by it. The deeper holes were much more, much poorer in carbonate. They appear to be below the carbonate compensation depth. And so you didn't have a lot of carbonate precipitation in them. They were very rich in siliciclastic sediments and in volcanic clasts. And based on the nanofossils, we got to about 35 million years old, which put us in about the right spot. This is what the rocks look like. These are basalts. Notice they show these very interesting, almost onion skin kind of alteration features. Some of them, however, are quite fresh and vesicular looking. Um, some are even glassy. This one came up and everyone's, whoa. <laughs> a lot of them are brecciated. This is a volcanic pressure, all replaced in here with calcite, various kinds of brushes. Some of these are basaltic brushes. You also got bonanitic brushes. So this is what bonanite brescia looks like. Um, you see this funny sort of weird sort of rosetti texture that's in the bonanites. It's very typical of them. Um, this is another... Bonanite, this is actually what we would call a, um, oh, what they call a hyaloclastite, which is to say glassy rock fragments in a ash-rich matrix. And this is what happens to it when it's really altered. And this is what it looks like when it's really fresh. Beautiful, glassy, vesicular bonanites in this crazy green stuff. Everybody wanted a piece of this because it was the most immaculate stuff that we probably pulled up out of the entire hole. Um, I got some of it. And uh, and we you know and, and it's great to, it's great stuff to work on. You can see you got all sorts of reaction rooms going on in here. So alteration people are all into this. They're neat. They're volcanic, but they're pretty fine grained. These are all pretty affinitic rocks. So how do you distinguish them? And this was a problem. We tried thin sections. Well, here's what the thin sections look like. Uh, these are these are pie cat whole section macroscopic images. Here's one of the basalts. And this is what the basalt looks like when you look at it in the cross polar. So we have polarized light and non-polarized light. Eh, not all that exciting. Um, here's another one. Equally unexciting. A couple of vesicles. That's about it. This one's a little bit more exciting. Looks like it's got some phenocryst in this. It's a bonanite. And sure enough, it's a bit more colorful. Um, olivine there. Some enstatite there. Pretty obvious to pick out. So the bonanites are a little bit easier to work with the basalts, but still pretty monotonous. Aferic to slightly ferric if you're looking at hand samples. Really no distinguishing macro scale features. Most of it was alteration. Eruptive style would show up, but that would be about it. Really no sample to sample variation in the assemblages and crappy recovery. And so our challenge on the ship, which we had to somehow find a way to deal with, was how to identify different eruptive units, how to document stratigraphy and downhole changes in composition, and how to do it quickly because Doing stuff with an ICP instrument takes a while. It takes about a week to collect the data set, and you're limited to the number of samples you can run. As it turned out, there was another tool on the ship which turned out to be ideal for this purpose, a portable X-ray fluorescence spectrometer, essentially an X-ray phaser gun that had been installed on the ship but not had not been used much. Other crew expeditions had tried it and not had been very happy with it. I ended up, as one of the geochemists, getting... You know, they asked me, can you see whether this is worth our time? 
can we make it a useful analytical tool? The answer was it was uh, to, the, to the extent that we were able to get a lot of data with it and I got a paper out of it. We ended up doing a lot of our work chemically in terms of defining stratigraphy because of that PXRF. And so as the cores were brought up, we would analyze the rock surfaces with the portable X-ray spectrometer, picking out key elements that are proxies for things. So we would look at chromium to proxy MGO. We would look at titanium zirconium ratios, which the instrument produced readily to proxy silica. We'd look at vanadium titanium to look at how hydrated the sample might be. And so this, these patterns that showed up in the data from the PXRF were confirmed by the ICP OES results. We'd run samples to see if we'd get the same sort of general distributions, and we tended to always do that. And so it told us, oh, okay, this PXRF is really giving us fine resolution on what we're bringing up. And so it became a very popular thing to do to the extent that we analyzed over, we did over 2,000 PXRF measurements from that point on on the expedition, which was, we were about two and a half weeks in by the time we decided to do this. And so between then and the end of the expedition, we made 2,000 PXRF measurements on these things. And, and they were calibrated measurements, so we actually have quantitative data. For them. Quickly on to the, telling you a little bit about the basalts. The key thing about the basalts to keep in mind is, is that what we did in the basalts, these are these unique four arc basalts that we have here as we drilled through the basaltic section into a mixed section, which included both basalt, pillow lavas, and diabasic and dikes into a section of purely diabasic rock, which is to say we drilled through the volcanics into the intrusive section, and we did it in about uh, 250 meters or so. And so we were not anticipating doing that, but we did. Um, that, so we actually were able to sort of pin ourselves to the bottom of the sequence, you know, pin ourselves to the intrusive part of the sequence um, with the drilling that we did in the basalts, and that was really, really helpful. We tried one other hole in the basalts. It didn't go as deep. It had some challenges with, uh, with faults and, and other things, and, and well, with gravel. Tony can tell you about trying to drill gravel. That's, bad. That's what you get in a fault zone. And it's you know, it, it ended up causing us to have to shorten the hole, but fundamentally the two correlate nicely and you can, uh, you can, you can, you're seeing the same stuff in both holes. So, so the basalts told us a nice tidy story. Chemically, we found regular changes in key indicators in the basalts, even though they all look the same, you would see jumps in the chemistry Plot, plotting titanium and chromium in particular, you would see big shifts in the chemistry that we ended up creating as unit boundaries, and that's how the units were actually defined. If you look at the bulk chemistry of these things, this classic vanadium-titanium diagram is used to distinguish tectonic settings sometimes. Ocean-ridge basalts tend to fall in the yellow field here. The four-arc basalts that we ran Sites 440 and 14, 14, 1440 and 1441 are all over here. They are higher vanadium at a given titanium abundance than normal ocean ridge basalts. This implies some degree of oxidation or enrichment that doesn't exist in ocean ridge basalts. But at the same time, they're quite different from the bonanites, which are the darker symbols down here. And so it really documented that these were a different set of rocks with a different sort of set of geologic origin than the mid-ocean ridge basalts. I simply throw these diagrams up because they kind of look similar and they're actually not from the same place. This is actually stuff from, from Expedition 351 that is further inboard of the Izubonin, but they see the same patterns there. And what the suggestion is, is that the basalts that we saw in the forearc are telling us not just about what's happening in the forearc, but may in fact be diagnostic of a lot of the marginal basins along that side of the Pacific. And so this subduction initiation basaltic signature appears to be a regional signature in this part of the world. Bonanites. Our two Bonanite sites were actually very close to one another. They were less than a kilometer apart. The reason for that mostly had to do with some place you could spud in and the ground rules with the Japanese who are very, very regimented about where you can drill in their territorial waters. The thing that's interesting is if you look at these two stratigraphies is they, they're really kind of different looking. 
they really are big differences moving from one hole to the other in less than a kilometer and very different sequences certainly at the bottom you have the same stuff and at the top you have the same stuff but the the stuff in the middle the different kinds of boninite and boninitic differentiates were really really distinct from place to place there's a large fault intervening between them and so maybe that's why we're seeing that but but the point is is that it's it's sort of surprising to see this much variety over such uh, such a short length scale we've been talking about boninites all semester so probably i should remind you of what they are again um, the IUGS definition of a bonanite is a mafic volcanic rock with greater than 8 weight percent MGO, greater than 52 percent SiO2, and less than 0.5 percent TiO2. Uh, and so the plots that are used to distinguish bonanites are the two diagrams I have here on the left, MGO versus SiO2, TiO2 versus MGO. Um, typically, bonanites are elevated in chromium and nickel, and they have very low aluminum, very low calcium. They are produced by melting a mantle that has already had basalt taken out of it, which means you're melting a mantle which is predominantly olivine and orthopyroxene, what we call a Hartzbergite. The result is, is that the minerals that crystallize out of bononites, at least early in the game, are the same minerals that most of their source is made of. And so mostly you have olivine and enstatite as your primary phenocryst phases in these things. And the thin section image here shows that, I think, really nicely. You have some very bright second-order color olivines and a lot of first-order white, first-order yellow kinds of enstatites as the primary mineral assemblages here. The other thing to notice about the bononites as compared to the basalts, which both are plotted on these two, these two diagrams on the left, is there's a, lot of there's a lot of chemical variation in the bononites. There's a lot of variability in SiO2 and in MgO and in TiO2 in them. They're all low in TiO2, but there's a lot of range. And it forms kind of tr different trends across the diagram. But by comparison, look at the basalts, all those green symbols. They have no range at all. They show no variation. They're remarkably homogeneous. This gets to something I was talking about on Tuesday, this idea that when you melt at a eutectic point, you basically get a very specific melt composition up. And the reason you're doing that is because you have three coexisting phases in equilibrium with that melt. And so you can't move that composition anywhere until one of those phases goes away. And so this is almost a classic demonstration of that. You're getting a remarkably limited range in MGO content, remarkably limited range in SiO2 content, and in TiO2 content in the basalts, and that's because they are actually eutectic melts. The bononites are definitely not. This scatter that you see, these trends that you see, are indicative of melting off of a eutectic, melting on a cotectic, where temperature changes composition. And so that's the biggest sort of petrologic difference between bononites and basalts. The basalts melted at the eutectic, bononites melted away one of those minerals, that mineral that melts away is clonopyroxene, and that allows its composition to vary a bunch. And with evolution, you actually will see in bononites that they can crystallize some clonopyroxene, as we talked about, and even plagioclase. We did the same kind of chemostratigraphy with the bononites. It was less necessary with the bononites, but we did it. The main thing that you saw in those trajectories was that as you moved up section from the bottom of the hole to the top of the hole in both sites, that titanium zirconium ratios decreased up section, that titanium went down and zirconium didn't change very much. And so that ratio went down as you went up section. Also, as you went up section, chromium increased. That meant that the bononites were getting more magnesium and more chemically depleted, more titanium poor, as you go up section, they got more primitive and they got more, they got more depleted. Uh, and some of this relates to transition, that you're going from a more voluminous magmatic system early in the game to one that is much, much less voluminous, uh, probably without a persistent magma chain. And this is sort of the, the color book version of the stratigraphy here. So you can see the two holes um, and they are color coded here. And so the the green stuff at the top of site 1439 correlates to the green stuff at the top of site 1442. The basaltic bononite that we have, the dark green doesn't exist at 1442, but the low silica bononites do. And then the more evolved lavas, which only show up a little bit in 1439, really dominate 1442. 
Key thing to understand here, though, is that in both cases, the Bononites and the Basalts overlie their own dikes. We ran into Bononitic dikes, intrusive textured Bononites in 1439, and we did the same thing at Site 1440, which means these rocks don't sit one on top of the other. They sit offset from one another. You have Bononites erupting from Bononitic feeder vents, and you have basalts erupting from basaltic feeder vents, and they're not running through each other. So this is not a vertical stack. This is actually somehow laterally offset. The other thing that shows up when you look at the chemical data, and this is just a plot of zirconium titanium that we did for this, is that there's really not much, there's a lot of sort of gradation within the groupings. In other words, within the fabs, there's some gradation. And within the bononites, there's gradation, but there's not much gradation between the groups. In other words, fabs are really distinctively different than bononites and vice versa. And that shows up in a lot of parameters. It shows up with strontium. It shows up with titanium. So it's, it's just, it's just you know, worth, worth noting that, that they really are talking about very different magmatic systems. And this is just to echo this idea that there are several different bononite magma series evident here that shows up, particularly on the TiO2 versus MgO plot. And that's probably telling you that, the mag that magmatism to make bononites is an intermittent periodic thing. You don't have a persistent magma chamber. It's not a high volume kind of thing. You're generating them and, you're, and they're going away and you're generating them and you're going away. And so it's a triggered kind of magmatic event, probably related to fluids coming off the downgoing plate. So back, getting into mineralogy and the petrology of these things, since that's what y'all are going to be looking at. We're not gonna look at four arc basalts, and the reason for that is that they're kind of boring. The four arc basalts all are augite plus plagioclase mineral assemblages, um, very typical. There's no pigeonite in them, which means there's not extreme fractionation, which is consistent with what the bulk chemistry shows. By contrast, the bononites have bimodal pyroxene assemblages. They have instatite rich assemblages and augite rich assemblages. And what you see is on average, a really instatite dominated sort of primary early growing pyroxene, an orthopyroxene, and then associated with augite, which is, and both of them, at least in the case of the low silica bononites, are reasonably magnesium. In the high silica bononites, which are the red symbols in the bottom sort of pyroxene triangle here, there's a little bit more diversity in terms of iron content, which is interesting. Um, you see still same break, instatite, a little bit more variation in composition, and then augite. Um, the high silica bononites maybe show a little bit more scatter and they show a little bit more iron enrichment than the, the low silica bononites. Why? Maybe it's different sources, degree of fractionation, I don't know. Um, the plagioclase data I threw on here just because it was on the diagram, they're both pretty similar. Very, very, very calcic plagioclases, labradorite to anorthite. These diagrams are a way of trying to see how out of equilibrium, the minerals that you're looking at actually are related to normal crystallization. The dotted lines on these plots are called Rhodes diagrams. Those are the plots, those dotted lines, if your minerals fall along those dotted lines, then they are probably in equilibrium with the primary bulk melt that made that rock. If they fall away from the diagram on a horizontal direction, then they're probably accumulated. If they drift down away from those curved lines, it's telling you that you have sort of progressive crystallization interstitially. In other words, you've isolated little packets of magma and you're now crystallizing out as these things solidify. The four arc basalts show this property quite dramatically. Their clinopyroxenes start up on, that, on those equilibrium lines and then sort of drop down below them. And that's an indication of late stage crystallization effects that are pretty typical in basalts. The bononites, interestingly enough, the clinopyroxenes show this as well, but in the case of the clinopyroxenes, none of them are actually on the equilibrium lines, at least none of the ones that Wadham found. The enstatites, by contrast, start at the equilibrium lines and then drop down, and then what's on the right diagram are olivines showing this the same way. Um, the olivines are pretty much always in equilibrium. And this is sort of, re this relates directly to the ease by which these things can crystallize and re-equilibrate. Olivines readily re-equilibrate with the melt, and so they tend to stick with the equilibrium assemblage, whereas pyroxenes can become zoned. They can actually record the history of melt evolution. 
What this is, however, doing is predominantly telling us that what we're seeing in most of the bonite samples are predominantly equilibrium conditions. We also looked at the glasses in the bonanites, and there's something really curious about the glasses. The orange dots of the glasses, the bonanites, the compositions, the bulk compositions of the bonanites are the little dots. And you notice the glasses are all much more silica rich than the bonanites whole rocks. The reason for this is really what bonanites are is a mixture. They're a mixture of very mafic crystals and very silicious whole rocks. And, and that's telling you that you aren't actually sort of crystallizing these things progressively. You're kind of crystallizing and mixing, okay? And it shows up, this is one of the ways that this shows up, that you've actually got sort of mixtures of very evolved bonanitic liquids with older bonanitic crystals. Now, that's the picture that comes from the bulk look at this, the sort of 5,000 to 10,000 foot look at these things. If you get into more detail, which is what we will be doing in class, you see other stuff. And this is what your predecessors from four years ago discovered in looking at stuff just from fall 1439. They found four horizons reflected as four samples in which there were anomalously crystallized pyroxenes. Ultimately, these had greater compositional variation than was seen throughout the sequence. They ran, and you can see the diagram on the right, it's the pyroxene quadrilateral with the, the purple and green symbols on it. The enstatite up to last night, this is, the, this is all the different pyroxene compositions that are in these four samples. There's quite a lot of range here. You have pigeonite, you have augite. It's almost a continuous variation. The other thing that shows up in the bulk chemistry of these things is an aluminum-rich component, which is known as a Shermax component. That shouldn't be there. It's, it's a disequilibrium effect. If you have excess aluminum in your pyroxenes, it's telling you rapid disequilibrium crystallization had to occur. The other thing that tells you things are not in simple equilibrium is what showed up when we started to image these pyroxenes, and that is zoning, chemical zoning in the pyroxenes. The picture on the left is zoning of magnesium and chromium and aluminum uh, in these pyroxenes. You'll notice there's a lot of gradation in the color and the shading here. Several different kinds of zoning are evident in these pyroxenes when you look at them in detail. There are three different names here, concentric zoning, sector zoning, patchy zoning. Concentric is exactly what you'd think. It's radiating rings. Sector is, is chunks and pieces. And patchy zoning is literally sort of less or is more, even more erratic sectors. You can get this kind of zoning in pyroxenes essentially by doing what would happen if you solidified the rock. You undercool it. By undercooling, you drive crystallization, which locally depletes the melt around that mineral of key elements, and so you begin to change the composition as the pyroxene continues to grow. That's what we largely see in the pyroxenes that we looked at. However, in these four sites, these four sections that, the that were discovered, there is something called oscillatory zoning evidence. That oscillatory zo zoning is backward zoning. You have change in Things like, for example, chromium going down in concentric zoning, but you actually see it go back up again and go back down and go back up and go back down. And so it's oscillating back and forth compositionally. The only way to do that is to add something to the melt that allows it to bounce back and forth. That involves some kind of change in the magmatic conditions. Maybe overturn in the magma chamber, that could potentially do it. The other possibility is injections of new magma or magma mixing. Uh, the picture on the right here is actually uh, Jesse is actually Jesse's cartoon of some of these features and how they interact with one another. You end up seeing them both. This is a backscatter image, electron backscatter up top of some of these pyroxenes. Notice the really clear sort of back and forth, back and forth zoning that shows up in them. Depending on which way you try to highlight it, you see it more or less prominently. This effect shows up really obviously in the small ground max pyroxenes, but in some of the big ones as well. And it also shows up in at least one of the samples in the 25R2 sample, it shows up in olivine, which is really weird because olivines are really hard to zone. That combination of overgrowths that we see very obviously in the samples and zoning points to both rapid cooling of the melts and admixture of exotic material into that magma. There's no other way to do it. And so the, you know, and there's other evidence that this must, must be what's going on in the system. What's on the right here is an image from the John Chervais Bononite paper 
documenting what are known as magma mingling textures. You can see that there are sort of texturally different domains within the bononite magmas in these pictures. This is just core sample scale. And the different domains are actually different degrees of evolution in the bononite. We have very different bononite bulk compositions as you move from the lighter horizons to the darker horizons in all of these pictures. It's, uh, it's really a prominent feature, particularly in, in, in whole 1442A, but it shows up in both sites. Uh, and so we know that we're interacting magmas with one another in this system in some fashion right from the get-go. Um, and Jesse's model for this is basically that what you're doing is you've got an evolving magma and and you crystallize that, you're progressively crystallizing that magma and then you inject something new. And if the injection is relatively gentle, then you might get a little bit of change on the margins and you get maybe an extra zone or some sector zoning. But if that injection is substantial, it overturns the whole magmatic system and you actually get a big mix. And if this happens repeatedly, it will produce an oscillatory zoning pattern. And so the argument here is that what we're seeing are magma bodies interacting with one another in a variety of very dynamic ways as they're trying to get to the surface. The thing that is certainly true that, you know, I think that all of the data we've collected thus far indicates is that you go that the, 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 the phenomenon of starting a subduction zone goes from being a really voluminous magmatic event. In other words, you make a lot of melt at the very beginning of this and you produce a lot of melting to produce four arc basalts. But then that melting event starts to die away pretty dramatically and that along the way, bononites are part of that. You have to add fluids to the source to get a bononite to happen at all. And, and that fluid addition seems to control the degree of, not just the degree of melting, but the, the regularity of melting as well. And so it's kind of a dying system once you get to bononites. Um, even though things are very hot. I mean, the, the thing that's come up with the pressure and temperatures on these is that the that the pressures are quite low for melting in all of these settings and the temperatures are quite high. So we're talking about melting temperatures of 1200 plus degrees Celsius, which is, you know, 50, 60 degrees Celsius higher than what we see at the Hawaiian Hawaiian volcanoes, which are Hawaiian hotspot basalts. And so you figure they'd be really hot. Uh, and the, these are actually pointing to hotter conditions, at least initially. So you start by making, you know, you start by making a lot of melt. And then as you start to make bononite, the melting just begins to die away until eventually things basically kind of just die out. Now, it took a long time because there are bononites on Ha'ajima and, and Chichijima Islands, which are just inboard of where we are with the, you know, in the expedition, that are probably five million years younger than the ones that we have, that dating on all of the rocks that we looked at on Expedition 352 lies between 52 and 50 million years ago. So everything happened in two million years. But you get back into Chichijima and you've got things that are as young as 46 million years in the Bononite sequences. So you had several million years of activity recorded in different places in here. And the question of Ophiolites, well, we confirmed what was there. Uh, the thing that we did the thing we definitely showed on the cruise, and that showed up right away, was that based on the stratigraphy, what we see at something like Trudos or a lot of sort of classic subduction related ophiolites doesn't happen here. In other words, Izubonin, you have geographic variation. You go from basaltic volcanic rocks here in the green on the map to boninitic volcanic rocks to, you know, well, excuse me, from, you go from intrusive rocks into basaltic volcanic rocks that are sitting on their dikes and then to boninitic rocks that are sitting on their dikes. And so you're creating a crust, but that crust is quite thin and, and you're not erupting boninite through basalt or vice versa. And that then doesn't look like Trudos as an ophiolite so much. It might look like the Samael ophiolite or some of the bigger ones, but that's an open question. And so the ovulite questions continue to go on, um, but the, the questions on subduction initiation, at least exactly how this dynamically runs, I think we've been able to, we've been able to sort of put some pins on, which is pretty cool.